Okay. Um, I did send him some information and I think uh, uh, Patrick and a Abby did too. So um, today I want to start with just sort of going over the, uh, the assignment. And to do that, I've asked uh, both Patrick and Abby to be prepared to sort of share what they did. And um, I'm going to start, um, I think, with Abby. You there, Abby? Okay. And what I want you to do is you can show your screen, but I also want you to talk about exactly how you physically accomplish this, <laughs> okay? And what challenges you had, and then I'll just open it up to everyone else to see if they had other ways of doing it, which other people can learn from it, okay? And Jack, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I just see your name. I just wanna make sure you're there. So can you make that, Larger. Sure. So I'll play. Keep going, keep going. Okay. So, you know, like the map covers the whole, you know, vision there. Okay. Sweet. So ex explain where you got your resources uh, and then how you did it and then how you got it up on into a Word document. Okay, um, so I use the, uh, the USGS National Map Viewer that you had linked in the syllabus. Um, and then to pretty much go through, I just used everything online. And then I also did like a manual version of it after. So I have like printouts of the screen as well, but I ended up using the same map. Um, yeah. So pretty much to the begin, do you want me to talk about how I delineated the watershed or do you just want me to jump into like the course test method or anything like that specific or just the whole thing? Um, well, you printed out a copy and you also looks like you did something using the draw function, right? Yeah. In Word. So how did that work? How did you do that? Um, yeah, so I used the draw tool, but I found it the easiest to pretty much start by uh, marking my sampling location, which I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it's this like thumbnail point right here. Um, mm -hmm. That made it easier for me to determine basically which direction was downstream. I did have the option to use like, you know, the North arrow and try to orient myself like that. Um, but I pretty much just pictured myself as if I was there because usually uh, Glen Avenue is on my right side. So I use that to pretty much determine that downstream would be down by Goss Pond. And then that's the mouth of the sub watershed. And then I highlighted all the streams and the branches through the topography. Did you do did you do that on the computer or did you first do it manually on um, the map you printed? First, I did it using the USGS software on the computer because mm -hmm. it was just there. So I think starting that way would be a bit easier. Plus I erased it like a million times before I decided what it would actually be. So it was a bit easier. <laughs> I probably would have had to print out like six sheets of paper if I did it that way first. But. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. What uh, so I struggled with with this was pretty much determining um, where to stop the sub watershed. I've never actually delineated like a very specific aspect of a watershed before. I kept wanting to be like, oh, well, this would be part of it. But um, yeah, eventually I got it narrowed down. Yeah, it's the high point of land that, you know, you find the highest point of land above your mouth, you know, where the X is. And that's going to be the top and that's going to be your other axis in which you're going to make decisions. Now, some people, what they do is they print that out and they actually do it on a desk <laughs> and make the shape and then go back in and then look at looking at their desk and looking at the shape, they actually put it, in, you know, then do the drawing, but you don't have wow. to do it that way. Yeah, I did sort of the opposite. I ended up drawing it afterwards, but <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a good way to double check because sometimes what you, when you're looking at a, something on the screen and you got something that's printed out in front of you, sometimes the printed version gives you a little more detail. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then to get pretty much the area, uh, so I did the width and the length. Um, and the cool thing about the USGS, the draw tool as well, is you can actually have it like take what your scale was and display the measurement on the ground. 
which is pretty neat. Um, and then, so what I did was I did each line and I got the measurements for them and then I added them up and then I divided them by the total number of lines to get the average. Mm -hmm. And then um, I multiplied both averages together, which was length on the ground to get the area, which was 1.31 square miles. Okay. And then I also sort of uh, messed around with the polygon method, which you could actually draw the polygon around the entire area. Mm -hmm. I feel like that wasn't as accurate because at times, I don't, you've probably used that function before it covers where you're like about to click and then you have to like click backwards so you can see what's underneath it. Yep. I tried to make it slightly transparent so that I could see through it and try to make it as accurate as possible. But I feel like definitely like using the lines and the averages of those lines was a bit easier than the polygon. Okay. But for that, I ended up getting 1.9 square miles. Okay. Um, and then the elevation gain, you can pretty much see already in the map, it tells you sort of this, like the um, contour intervals, um, because there's like here we have 400 and then there's one line and then it's 500 and kind of gives it away right here. It says 450, but it's a difference of 50 feet between each interval. And then um, I know my highest elevation is above 500, but it's lower than 550 because there's not another line. Um, and then the same goes for the lowest elevation. So your contours are 50 foot, 50 feet contours, mm -hmm. right? And you know, topos normally go down to about 20 feet or 6.6 .6 meters um, if you're in the metric system. And so realizing there's obviously with 50 foot contours, sort of the topography is sort of flattened in a sense. You don't see steepness as well. Does everyone understand that? Okay, so you can choose any, any contour you want, but just realize the larger the contour, the less the physiographic picture you have of the, of the, uh, of the space you're working in. Okay. Yeah, and that was actually pretty reflective of my slope as well. Like if we jumped to that part, it was only like a 0 0.6 degree slope, but, um, sort of rewinding a bit, the actual stream order. When I did it on here, I used the same draw function and I just changed colors um, to separate first, second, and third order streams, um, great. as you great. can see in the picture. Um, and then it also did measure those lines for me. I did it manually as well with the string. And mm -hmm. I feel like that was actually a bit more accurate um, to use the USGS version as opposed to the string, <laughs> but um, yeah. No, this is good that you, you tried both because you know, the the method you use only has a certain precision and the only way you can judge the precision precision is well there's two things there's accuracy and precision okay does anybody know what accuracy is versus precision uh, well will i see you smiling so why don't you answer <laughs> um, i think it is precision is the ability to be in one contained area where accuracy is about like general closeness to the whole target. I could, I could tweak out what you said and say yes, but it's not exactly right. Anybody else? Yeah, Dave. I think I think accuracy is getting the numbers right. In other words. If I get the numbers wrong, the elevations or contour numbers wrong or any numbers wrong in the equation, then it's going to be an inaccurate answer. Okay. Um, since I was my first job, my very first job, I was a lineman for a survey, surveyor. And back then we used to stretch a chain for distance and, the, and you really in the temperature would change the ability for the chain to be measured. Um, my friend who's the surveyor now uses a laser. Okay. And so when he's doing a survey, his precision is much greater using a laser than using a chain or using a tape. Okay. Which came next after the chains tapes came next and then string lines. So precision really has to do with the methodology and the Judgment of the precision is, is the margin, what's called the margin of error. 
Okay, so when you're comparing two different ways, you will see how much apart they are. So if I measured with a chain and I measured with a laser, I would see a I would see how far apart those two measurements were, and that would give me an indication of what the precision of the chain was, because the laser is considered first order or the best way to survey. Okay. And so it really has to do with the preciseness of the measurement, thus precision, okay? Accuracy is basically replicability. That is, if you do it the first time and you do it the second time and you do it the third time, you basically are, should be, if it's very accurate, you'll get the same number every time you do it, okay? Now, if, you're, if you do it five times and you get a range, um, or a difference between the mean and the extreme, um, which is you know three plus standard deviations out. That gives you sort of an idea, and we're gonna get in a little bit of stats at the end of the course about confidence intervals, but basically um, at a 99% confidence interval, you know a certain value is within the population that you, no matter if you measure an infinite number of times, okay? 99% is better, 95 is, you know, but you can get all the way down to one standard deviation, which is about 66%. And um, that's not very confident that your, your answer is <laughs> within the population. So, so accuracy is basically the ability to replicate your findings. Okay, so those are the two differences. And, it, and it's good that you know that now, especially for you people that are taking your first course, because as you get into it, these things come back in different forms as you move through the curriculum of your program. Okay, sorry, Abby, I went off on a tangent. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you basically got a percentage total and then the slope, okay? And you got the slope of how? So I did um, the elevation increase of the longest stream drainage divided by the distance of the longest stream. And then to actually get the elevation, I sort of interpreted that as um, I took the elevation of the mouth and I subtracted that from the elevation up here because I figured this was going to be the largest um, mm -hmm. yep. like elevation change. And yep. um, so then from that, I got uh, 255 feet, and then I divided that by 15,681. Or, well, I'm actually referencing my written version, so they're a little bit different, but um, so it's 12,000 here. But um, Yes, 12,000. So it's, it's basically slope is rise over run, right? Remember that mm -hmm. old saying? <laughs> the rise is the measurement of the contours, the run is the length of the stream. Okay, and it comes out as a, a decimal, and then you basically, if you multiply by 100, it'll give you the fraction or the percentage, okay? So what was your length of your third order stream? It was 12,000? Mm -hmm. And what was, the, uh, what was the elevation difference? Uh, it was between, for my written version, I have it right here. It was um, 500 versus 245. But I can actually scroll to that if it makes it a bit easier to review. So 12,000. So I'm looking right here. Because these were the numbers that I got um, when I measured it. Okay, so instead of the, so it's 15,681, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's the longest stream drainage. So the third order wouldn't actually have been the longest. Okay. I'm just, uh, give me a sec. I'm just doing real quick. Okay, let me just make sure I got this right. Because 255 divided by 15681 equals, okay, that's a, that is a, fraction, 0 0.016, right? Mm -hmm. Now, go back up to your numbers. Okay, you have, the slope is 0 0.016%, but you haven't multiplied by 100. 
Yeah. So after I got the percentage to get degrees, what I did was I actually divided. No, 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 no. Before you do that. Okay. The fraction of uh, 255 divided by 15,000. Okay. Oh, okay. Yep. Is 0 0.016. That's the fraction. If now you have to multiply by a hundred, which gives you 1.6%. Oh, so I didn't do it that way. Right. Yeah. So 1.6, that is the slope, is 1.6%. Oh, okay. Does everyone understand what I just did? It's a, it's a common mistake. <laughs> okay, and then, then you know, 1.6% um, of 90 degrees, because it's, uh, it's a, let's see, flat of... Yeah, so 90 degrees. It's 1.6 percent of 90 degrees, and that'll give you your degrees. Okay. Okay, because it's horizontal, it's vertical, right? Straight up and down is 90. Flat is zero. So that's a 90 degree number you're dealing with, and so it's 1.6 times 90 will give you your slope in degrees. Okay. Does that make sense? Sort of. Can you walk me through what you did for two fifty five over fifteen? Well, that was your that was your math. You said the you said the rise rise was two fifty five, right? Yes, but so you said you multiplied it by a hundred afterwards. The rise divided by the run gives me yeah. a fraction. It's not the percentage. The only way you get the percentage is multiply the fraction times a hundred. Okay. Does that yeah, make sense? I had a hard time figuring this one out, um, but that makes a lot more sense now. Right, that's the fraction of 100%, right? <laughs> one over one would be 100%. Of the rise over the run, so your output is needs to be converted again. It needs to be put into percentage. Yeah. And so the way you put a fraction into percentage is multiplied by 100. Okay. Okay. Michael, I had another question related to slope. Yeah, Jack. Um, I saw the, the instruction said um, by the, so calculate the slope by dividing the elevation increase of the longest part of the stream drainage by the distance of the longest stream length. I took that the stream length to mean like a discrete, discrete stream within your watershed. But I understand now to mean that, uh, first or second or third or so on order. So is that the way well, to look the, at it? Yeah, it's whatever, wherever you, what we call the mouth, which is the junction of your string where you end. Okay, it, it may go into another stream, it may go into a lake, it may go into the ocean, right? But that's the bottom of the stream basin that you're studying. Because you chose a point someplace along there to, to be your observation point, right? Correct. And so you'd have to go down slope until you got to the next order stream. And that's the end of the basin. You go up slope until you get to the highest elevation, and that's the top of your basin. Okay, so when you... Ch everyone chose randomly chose and put a pin saying this is where we're looking at my stream it has a top it goes up until it's it hits the top of the ridge and it goes down until it runs into another major stream junction and obviously because these are nested basins your little basin that is your pet stream basin is embedded within a much bigger basin, right? It's just one arm of a much bigger basin. Unless your stream goes directly into the ocean. That makes sense. I, I think I was just confused by what you meant by um, longest stream length. Yep, okay. That, yeah, but you, but I, you got it now? Yeah, yeah, so I'll, uh, yeah. Now I understand that you, you mean like Strahler order, yeah. either using with the first or the second or whichever is the one. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, so.
So Abby, what's next? Is I think that's it, right? Yeah, from here I pretty much just added pictures of the manual method and pictures of my math as well, but... Um, so I would like the next time you do something to put it in Excel. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I okay. can do that. And I'm going to tell everyone, I, I don't want you to do it off, off Excel and just plug in a number. I want you to put in all the numbers you're going to do the calculation with and do the calculation. Okay. I just don't want a number plopped in that was off Excel calculated. Okay. I want, I want you to have Excel do the calculation. And I know there's a spectrum of people in their comfort with Excel, but this is a safe place to practice it, okay? This is a safe place to practice it. And when I, next week, I already told Patrick that I'm gonna go over the runoff. I'm gonna show you how to do the math. And I'm gonna show you how to set it up in Excel. So I'll start to teach you how to create a model. Okay, great. So, um, why, don't, why don't you, uh, Patrick, why don't you, why don't you do the cover type? Mute, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's, just, just do that, we all know what it means. <laughs> I keep like talking to the screen and you got, you know, feel stupid. Um, so, okay, before I share my screen, um, I have a couple things. Uh, because the map to the, uh, you know, like I, I felt like you were trying to convey the field assessment. And so using, using a ruler or my graph paper, you know, or, or my, my pencil on the hard copy map uh, was something that felt important. So I did like, uh, Abby did, I printed out a hard copy from the USGS, like national map uh, website. And I learned that when you print it, it prints the scale for the map. So it's actually really handy handier tool than I had initially realized. Um, and I also, like back before iPhone, I picked up uh, <laughs> one of these driving around Western Mass and Vermont class four roads. And these things are awesome. I see smiles, so I know you all know what I mean. Um, so uh, I did- Thanks for Jack, tell him what you just showed. Oh, excuse me, Jack. Yeah, the Delorme um, Atlas and Gazetteer. I'll send you a link uh, in an email. But if you don't know about them, they're awesome and keep one in your car. Um, oh, I have my own. Yeah, of course you do. Of course you do. Um, we're all savvy folk here. Um, but yeah, so, so, you know, so I initially started with that map and then Murphy's Law, my uh, basin was like straddling three different maps. So that wasn't uh, a handy move. So I did the USGS piece. And then um, I, have a, I have a tablet that lets me write on it, which is super handy. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to find my... Stream cover. So I, um, everybody seeing this well? Can I make it bigger or anything? Why don't you make it a little bigger if you're going to show the picture and then you can come down and show okay. the table. Very good. Um, so yeah, so here's my picture. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's map and uh, I have, uh, you know, this tablet allowed me to kind of go in and it, it was, I, I, you know, it's the same as the drawing tool, just a little more tactile. And I really, I, I, I'm a pretty spatial learner. So I had like three maps on my desk and um, I did the uh, cross hatching kind of area um, on paper. And then I went to the USGS. Um, this watershed, it, you know, this little sub basin is pretty big. So, um, you know, getting up into this area and finding seasonal runoff streams and things like that for my different, um, you know, delineation was uh, needed a, like a kind of multimodal approach, shall we say. Um, but uh, yeah, so I got my map and, you know, this is for the, um, the land use, like the cover type assessment. So that's, yeah, um, that's what, that's what I want you to focus on. Yep. So I, um, you know, I, I, you can see in here that the dotted line is the boundary. Um, I, I used my pencil to basically, you know, between uh, this map and Google Maps, I went and zoomed way, way in and just like basically went down each road and put a little dot on every home, um, you know, every building. And then some of the larger homes uh, are, you know, like agricultural buildings and stuff. I, I maybe put like a double dot instead of trying to like manage all the different sizes. And then later in the notes, I basically just, Kind of came up with a rule of thumb to apply to this property, assuming 
from a conversation I had with Michael about the fact that this is a, um, you know, kind of a from the hip, like initial assessment. Um, so I, I took the assumption that I'm not trying to get compulsive, uh, you know, so I basically just assumed that every home uh, would be 0.6 acres. And that was based on a pretty random sample of the homes. And, and they did end up being between 1,000 and 2,000 square feet with like a couple exceptions. Um, so so let's, let's stop for a second okay. and un understand this methodology, okay? So you identified every structure on the watershed as the best you could. Right. And you marked it. And then you're, you're coming up with a coefficient of footprint. Yeah, like an average. I just like an of, average, but you actually went and did a couple of cover analyses. That's right. Uh, of a couple of those just to get an idea of what they were. And what did you, did you use Google Earth to do that? Like we I did, did in yeah. class? I used, I used Google Earth's measurement tool and I did the four point kind of polygon area. Kind of as I was going, I would, every kind of screenshot I had, I would pick one and I, I know the area well, so I know that, you know, the average residential, you know, plot is about an acre, you know, of, of like yard and home. And then whatever else isn't clear cut is just woods. So, um, you know, it's hill, hill area outside Montpelier. Um, that's, that's, that's great. Um, does everyone understand this methodology he did? Is someone speak up if they don't. Okay, this is important because when you model, and I you remember my oyster analysis paper, you know, you, it's not, you basically do have to come up with some number, and um, I will show you, I'm gonna follow this up with a, with a further, a further uh, explanation of what we did in the oyster, okay? But um, this, this is, this is the right way to do it when you're dealing with a large spatial analysis and you're doing a first order assessment, okay? A rapid assessment, okay? And so uh, I appreciate that. That was uh, very creative, Patrick. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> I'll be honest, it felt like a uh, 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 triage. You know, I was, <laughs> holy crap, how do I, how do I get this even remotely accurate? And then I, you know, I kind of, I remembered our conversation about how it was a first order assessment and I made some assumptions and, you know, having a little bit of like, not sure, still learning what Michael's expecting uh, out of like our, our deliverables, you know, uh, you'll see later that I just made a bunch of notes and kind of like named my assumptions um, for the sake of the formulas. So, so moving on, um, I, these dots represent homes. The, the roads obviously are the kind of solid lines next to the dots. And then I went in and circled in blue, uh, kind of a different land use that was the, uh, the kind of open, you know, non-wooded area. Um, this is a fairly uh, rocky, like headwaters up to the Northwest here. Um, and that's a mountain ridge up there. Um, so, you know, there's not a whole lot of standing water. I think I had like maybe a handful of acres of, of lakes that I just took note of as I was looking at my residential plots. So let me back up. What assumption did you make about the width of the roads? Um, I will mention that in just a second. Okay. Not, I, I, I went into, um, very briefly, I went to uh, Google and said Vermont class four road requirements. Because again, I know that most of these roads are, are kind of like gravel roads up into the hill town kind of. Okay. Explain uh, to people who don't understand what a class road is. Oh, excuse me. Um, I don't know it terribly well, but there are classes of road. I think class one being like your interstate or your state road, your very developed road that gets plowed off in PS. Um, it's super relevant up here. And then they step down from there and class four is another way of saying like a crappy dirt road. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's rarely plowed. Um, um, you definitely need four wheel drive to live on one. And uh, it turns out that the requirement for it to be a class four road is 10 feet per lane of traffic, um, which isn't, um, that's actually like classing up, like that keeps it from being a class five of which there are plenty as well. Um, but I just, again, uh, knowing that most of these up in this Northwest area here are class four, basically this main artery that you can kind of visualize running through um, the, the plot is kind of the only paved road. Um, so, yeah, again, I made an average kind of coefficient just for the sake of this first order uh, uh, okay. 
what's it called? Um, so, so just to let people know, there's five classes in Vermont, okay? Mm -hmm. There's six classes in the state of New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so, so yeah, so I think, you know, that was pretty much it. And then you can see I've written in, for the sake of just bookkeeping, I wrote in the distances that I found. Um, and I didn't have good results with the road. So when we get to that calculation, maybe Michael can correct my, my math. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, is there anything else you want me to say about the drawing here, Michael? No, no, that's great. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Yep. And then this was, yeah, I basically did this all on my tablet and then I cut and pasted and, you know, imported it um, to, the, uh, to the document. And then here's my notes on, if I do this, does that make more on the screen? Yeah, which table do you want us to focus on? Okay, I just was making sure you could see it all. So over here on this this table to the right. Okay, make it bigger so that table's bigger. We'll do, we'll do. Are we getting bigger? Yep. Okay, good. Yep. So that's okay. my raw data, as you can see. Um, I did road in, that's just miles, that's just length. Um, and I'll account for width in a later table. Um, field, uh, you know, homes, and this is again, this is quantity. So that will also be multiplied out later. Forest cover uh, wasn't really quantified because it's the remainder in our equation. Um, and ponds and streams. So, and then here's just some totals for me to reference later with my formulas. Okay, and, hold on for a sec. Sure. So when you say quantity, like field lawn, what is the unit? Excuse me, yeah, so that unit um, is acres. So when you create a table, put the units in so we know what you're talking about. Okay. Um, okay. Yes, I will, I will in my defense, uh, the quantities are, are listed later. Um, but uh, yeah. I, I understand any, any, this is just a modeling thing. Any time, no, you don't have to do it right now. Okay. It's just, you say what it is and underneath it, you put the units. Okay. It. Yep. And, and uh, that way, even if you did it someplace else, every table you do, you should have it. So don't change it now. It's fine. I just okay. want to make sure everyone understands that. Okay. Because the units could be different, right? It's true. Yeah. And they are in fact, in this table, there's three different ones. Okay. Um, so then I just did some sum. Do you want me to go into the formulas at all or? Well, tell us what the third unit is. I see acres, miles, and? Quantity here. Number of houses. That's right, just straight up number of houses. Okay, really so, under, so but... yeah, underneath it, you just put NO houses or, okay. or pound side houses, so we know it's number of houses. Got it. Um, okay. Yep. So, and then down here, I use the sum function, mm -hmm. um, which is on mine is this little sigma sign. It's the um, kind of universal, um, okay. but I'm in the habit of just entering equals sum, and um, it it basically is adding this entire data set. Um, and then Excel is really smart, so once you build a function once, you can copy this and then paste, 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 and it'll transfer that across. Um, so. After control, I did that. Yeah, so paste is control C for people who don't. Oh, control uh, V. Oh, yeah, well, it depends on, con control C is copy. That's right. You have to hit control C and then you control V when you place it on other cells. Right. So, um, okay. So why don't we go to your, do your results? Okay. And then I also had uh, from my delineation, uh, the one piece of data that isn't, calculated is just the number of acres um, on my, uh, yeah, from my delineation. Um, and then over here. Can you make that just a little, it's a little larger? Yes. Yeah, that's getting, okay, great. Okay, and then um, here's the notes that we discussed earlier, the impervious surfaces. You'll notice the roads are missing and I'll address that in a second. Um, homes. And then in parentheses there, that's my assumption. I assume 0 .6, 0 0.06 acres, which equates to about 1,500 square feet. And from, from my, my experience in the trades, I know that that's a pretty average size home, give or take, um, especially around here. Um, you know, subdivisions get well up into the 2,000 and 2,500 with, with regularity and even more. But 
1,500 square feet is my judgment of the best size of a house. So maybe I was just. No, it's fine. It's, it's your... uh, and then field lawn. Let me, um, let, me, let, let me stop you. Sure. You notice he put his assumptions in an array. See the line around there? Okay, he called it notes on calculations. They're basically assumptions. All, every model has an assumption. It's good to state your assumptions. So, Pete, you know, the answer is only as good as the assumptions <laughs> and the data you put in. So it's good to always set your assumptions aside in a different array. Mm -hmm. You can either highlight it with color, or you can put a box around it, or you actually, you could create another sheet and put all your assumptions on a complex model on one sheet in a workbook, okay? And so um, these are, this is a very simple model, but I really appreciate that he, you know, s s created an array for his assumptions. So then same as with the home, uh, with the impervious surface, my fields and lawns um, for lawn cover, I assumed for every home, there would be one acre of yard. And again, I went around and kind of took some just random sample of close to the mouth of the watershed up near the headwaters and it that jived well enough for a first order assessment. So I went with that. Um, so on number 71, let's go to residential yards. Yes. Okay, can I click on 71? Yes. Uh, what's the formula? Um, well, there isn't a formula because it's just another, it's an inference from the quantity. Right, but once you plug in something, uh -huh. once, you never plug it in again. Understood. And so yeah. in, your, in your assumptions, you should have a separate cell that's just a number and above it or below it or next to it says number of acres per household and then the number. And then you reference that number one times the number of houses and that's how you get that answer. Understood, so I would just add that into this table. Right, This I'm just talking about how to, mo how to model with transparency. Cool, um, so I, since I do, um, on, the, on the subject of formulas again, since I do have number of houses, mm -hmm. uh, quantity over here in cell N57, mm -hmm. I can come over here and hit equals N57 and it will just be referencing that initial cell. So if I yeah, but that yeah, but if I was looking at your at the spreadsheet, uh -huh. and I said residential yards, and I went back to where you got the seventy one, I said, well, that's the number of houses. You're referencing the number of houses. That's all right. you're doing. Wouldn't my, assumption, wouldn't my assumption for field and lawn carry because no, because yeah, it, it's right. But you uh, go up to I. 56 put in one right there just put a one in okay and somehow you need to label it so they know that's the okay that that is the acres of yard per household right yes and then 70 then if you go down to 65 C uh -huh. equals start with equals Go back up to I-56 times, and then go to your number of houses. Um, so it's over there in the yeah, other table. Yeah, I just need to get there without removing my cell. There. Just hit return. Okay, so we're back here. Hit return. Yep. Okay, now if I went in there and looked at that formula, I would say, oh, I see how he got that number. I understand. Now this is a very simple calculation, but often you have more than one variable in a calculation, right? So you wanna be able to, that's what transparency means. I can go back all the way either to an assumption number, which is one, or I can go back to raw data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You never, never enter the assumption number more than once and you never enter the raw data more than once. Everything else is a calculation in Excel for a model. That makes sense. Does that make sense for everyone? And Jack, I know you're not seeing this, but I hope we're trying to make sense. <laughs> and Jack. we're Jack, we're recording this so you will see this whole thing. Great, thank you so much. 
Okay, uh, so so now we, we got all that out of the way. So just give us a general idea of what, obviously Forrest is gonna be the big player, right? Yeah, and this, uh, let's see, so Forrest, um, 55, 91, 81, minus, so again with the transparency, I didn't, the forest is an extrapolation, if you will, like I have my total acres over here. Right. And I, I have a sum of all of these acres, which is um, gonna be 261, 66. Mm -hmm. And that is what is going on with this formula. Um, it, it's again not transparent like you just explained, but um, that's so you added all your other areas and subtracted it from the total. I did. Right. So you could have actually had a subtotal. You could have added a, a, a row in there and says subtotal of all land used except forest. Right. And then put the sum in there. Okay. And then subtract that from the total acreage, and that would give you. And then you'd have to label, you know, label. Well, you have it forced. So, so I understand what you did. Okay. Um, okay. That that's great. Can you go it, back up? So everyone, look at the percentages real quick. So we got ninety-five forest. We got uh, almost five percent fields, pastures, lawns, and then. 0.8 percent so just go back up to the uh so this is that that's what it looks like visually and that's what he got okay so when we say gee it's because we're going to be talking about a pervious surface when we talk about water quality mm -hmm. okay and so so this is uh a really small percentage pervious it's 95 percent forested even though there's all these lines and all these blue things and all, you know, it's 95% forested. <laughs> so, so that's a relatively potentially healthy watershed to support aquatic organisms in the major streams. Mm. Okay. There's a relationship to impervious service and, and habitat for the, what we call the keystone species or the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, predator species in a stream. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Okay, that's all I wanted. I, could, I, um, could I just briefly, the roads piece? Sure, go ahead. I totally uh, didn't do it correctly. Um, and I don't know which part I didn't do, but maybe for the sake of, I know we have- So you got now. your linear feet, right? Yeah. yeah you're, com have, you're comfortable with that, right? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that I think that might be the number that's wrong, but for the sake of talking about how I did the math, let's assume it's correct. And you said 10 feet wide? And I assumed 10 feet wide per lane. So, so that's 20 feet. That's right. So 20 feet times the length. Yep, so that's, that's what this one is. Right. Length that's times 20. Square feet. How many square feet in a square mile? So. 39.52 square feet times uh, 43,560 feet in a square mile. Okay, that's an assumption. You put it up in your assumption array. Yes, sir. Okay, keep and going. Then, and then uh, I come down to acres and I do um, square miles times 640 acres per square mile, another assumption. Um, and that gives me my total acres. Okay, of, of roads. Yes, but it's 25,000 and change, but my total acres is only 55, you know, almost, yeah, 5,591. So it's like something ain't right, as they say. Um, so you sure that a class four road is 10 feet per lane versus just 10 feet wide? I'm not sure. That's how I read it, but <laughs> I'm not sure. I believe it's 10 feet wide, a class okay. four road. Okay. Um, yeah. And realize that's not the pavement. That's the right of way. Yes. Could be more narrow. Yep. So, yeah. so those are things, you know, one thing is you go out and measure a little piece of the road in the watershed and say, I'm going to use this as my, as my placeholder. Yeah. I think that's what happened too, is that um, the area where I'm my, my specific observation site is about 10 feet per lane. Um, it's, it's right off of a paved area. 
And so it's a nice big proud wide gravel road. It's not a little, you know, two track. So you sure that that part of the road's not classified as class three? Um, yeah, uh, these are details I didn't dive far enough into. Right, okay, um, well that's fine. Yeah, this is fine and you did a great job. Uh, obviously, everyone, you know, we're gonna try to make you good modelers, okay? And so that's why we're just going through this. Hmm. Okay. That's, you put mine to shame, so don't worry about it. <laughs> I struggled doing the digital aspect of this. I was like, most of my personal skill comes from like teaching, hand drawing maps. So the hand drawn part was like that. And then like sitting in front of my computer was like banging my head against the wall sometimes of like, no, why did you delete that line? I wanted it there. So yeah. that was the frustrating part. But like just hearing your, you and Abby and your thought process was really helpful. Oh, cool. Hey, anybody else? Yeah, this is definitely, particularly Patrick, your work is, is making me reflect on my own and, and obviously Michael's comments too. And just like how the level of precision and accuracy is uh, certainly higher when you take into account things like actively trying to model out such a large area. And that's something that I should, I should probably do a better job on. Right. And um, I know both you and Dave did Beaver Brook. It's one hell of a big watershed because I've done a lot of research on Beaver Brook, both the upper and lower Beaver Brook. So I was, <laughs> my head hurt quite a lot when I was trying to do the cover type analysis. Well, it goes well up into Gilsum. <laughs> it definitely does. <laughs> so, okay. So I'm going to share a screen and just uh, follow up with this. Just uh, go back to the, um, Okay. So what are you seeing? It looks like the presenter view of your um, Voice of River Watershed. Of slideshow. It's the presenter view. Gee, here we go again. The Luddite hits. Okay, hold on. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know why? Because I have uh, two. Okay, I got more than one PowerPoint open. That's why. Okay. I'm going to stop share. Okay. And then start share and tell me what you see. Uh, one. What do you should see now? Anybody? It's still the presenter view for me. Yeah? Yeah. Well, one more time. How can you tell it's the presenter view? Because it's not full screen. Oh. Right? OK. So. Also, Dave, there's, there's tools when you present that show up only on your screen, like a timer and the next slide and stuff like that. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, I'm trying to find you guys. Oh, there you are. Another problem is I move my screens around so they're not my mouth, you know, I go from one screen to the other, I'm going backwards. So that takes a little bit of a, well, we may just have to stay with the presenter view. So you're in the presenter view? 
Okay, that's okay. So, um, this is the oyster. Okay, this is primarily uh, um, the area where I wrote the procedures to get the information as far as cover type. And so, um, uh, in that regards, we did the exact same thing, but we did a little more sophisticated uh, analyses than just a sort of a Google Earth. Um, we actually were using uh, GIS to do it, but you know, don't worry about it, it's the same procedure, okay, in order to do this. And it's very similar to what you did, okay? Often, and also one thing I do when, um, right here, I often will break things into quarters or halves, and that way I, instead of drawing, I can quickly do a much quicker analysis, saying, well, look, almost one quarter over here, one quarter of the whole lot is trees. Right, and so I can do a much faster analysis than drawing if I wanted to. Um, again, it depends on what you're gonna use it for. And then for our analysis, and this is a research project for NOAA, we had, uh, we had to look at every zoned area to determine what the land use was, okay? Because when we were gonna do a build out analysis, uh, that is, every zone has a different lot size, okay? So roughly, these are rounded, but 40,000 square feet is one acre, okay, right here. And so half an acre is roughly 20,000 square feet, and then you can get up and see. So these, we had five towns in this study area, so we, these are all the size lots that are zoned in that study area, and so, what we did is do exactly what Patrick did, okay? And we went and created a set of data and we chose the number of lots. Statistically, you can see if you know the total number of households, lots you have, you can actually statistically determine what is the sample, what's the sample size in order to determine these percentages, okay? But don't worry about that, you know? Um, and so what we did is for each lot, okay, and this, this uh, PowerPoint is in the uh, resources folder, so you will have that, this table if you ever need it. Um, but you can see uh, as you went to a larger and larger lots in this watershed, and this is just happens to be this watershed, you know, you're moving up to 68% uh, forested, you, you notice and this is based on a 150,000 square foot lot, okay? And so um, this is by parcel, not by watershed, but it's exactly what Patrick did for his. And so you can see that we did this. And then what you can do is take that data and over here is the, this up here is structures of footprint, okay, at the top. And this is what Excel can do for you. So what you do is you create two columns. You create one column of, of, of square footage and then one column percentage of total of footprint, okay, or impervious surface. And once you've created two columns, you can use the graphing function to create a dot graph, okay, relating the data for all the different lot sizes to the percentage of total impervious. And then in the graph function, you can do what's called a best fit curve. And what this does is shows you that this is not a linear curve, it's more of a, a receding logarithmic curve or exponential curve. Why is it exponential? Because between here and here, it's very, you cover a lot of ground here. And from between here and here, you cover a lot less ground here. And so it's, it's really an exponential curve, but that doesn't matter. And you can ask for the best fit um, slope. Remember the slope, remember back in you know, <laughs> algebra, y equals mx plus b? Well, obviously there's different types of slopes. And so this is the slope of why, so if you know uh, what size lot, all you have to do is put it into the X function right here, 
and it will give you the percentage of the total that's impervious on this slope. That's why you want a slope. And so you basically put in the X, you get the Y, or if you've got the Y, you can figure out the X. Okay, it's pretty simple math. Um, R squared means is, is how close is the data correlated with the best fit curve? And anything above 0 0.80 R squared means you've got a pretty good data set. You're, you basically have a, something that represents the whole population. If I got an R of near 50, I would say this is crappy data, <laughs> or I don't have a large enough sample size. Okay, and so I didn't do these, I, you can do this mathematically, but all you have to do is create two columns in Excel. You create one that basically has the square footage of the lots, and then you create another column that has the percentage of total for structure footprint, which is from the data we had, and you can create this scattergram, best fit curve, and you can create these, these uh, slopes and R square functions just in the in the graphing function of Excel. Okay, so just let you know. So from this, if I had this formula, I would just use this formula, you know, no matter what, right, depending on the square footage. Unfortunately, it only goes up to 200. But I could probably, you can see it starts to flatten out there. It probably goes down, and you notice on the size of watershed that was Patrick's, you got up to 95%. Well, no, what did you get, Patrick? You got... Um, That's right. For forested, it was 95%. Right, right. But this is structure footprint. So you'd get down close to zero. And you had a really small number for structure footprint. Okay. Here's the same thing for forested. Okay, if we continue this curve out, it'll eventually probably flatten out, but it gets up to Patrick's 95%, okay? So that's, I just wanted to show you how you can take data and then create a tool, and this tool is this formula. Okay, if I know that Y in this formula, Y is the percentage total of the footprint, and I know X is the size of the lot, all I have to do is have one or, no, one or other of those numbers and I can figure out, you know, what I'm playing with. This is based on field data, you know, data that was, you know, well, it was map, it was GIS analysis data. And actually we went out and confirmed a couple of these sites, even from the GIS analysis. So we, it's called ground truthing. We went out and ground truth a couple of these lots. Does this make sense to everyone? Except for, Jack? <laughs> so I sent you this, Jack. I sent you this uh, PowerPoint. I'm following along. This makes perfect sense. Okay. Any other questions about that? And I'm going to figure out how to do this. Okay. I guess, I'm sorry. I just briefly, you would use this in the field just to visualize the data you're getting? Uh, no, I would use it. I mean, instead of doing what you did, once I have a table like this, and I know, you know, and I know what the zoning is for, you know, what zoning, some towns don't have zoning, okay? But a lot of towns have a zoning map. And so all the, all the structures in that, or other plots or parcels in that map have to meet the zoning regs of that zone. And so for each of the zones, for half acre lots, I have a number. For quarter acre lots, I have a number. For an acre lot, you know, so those are the zones that land you, um, planning boards use. Okay. And is yours in Montpelier or outside of Montpelier? It's outside Montpelier. It's on the way, to, it's on the way north up to Worcester. Um, what town is it in? I think it straddles Worcester and Montpelier. Oh, okay. So you'd have to look at, see, you know, you, that's the problems with watersheds. You know, you'd have to look at, you know, what the zoning is for that part of Worcester and, you know, what part of whatever. <clears throat> okay. So that's some of the problems. The same issue you'd have if you're at the upper Beaver Brook, you go into Gilson. I don't know if Gilson has zoning. I know Keene does. So... Okay, any questions about that?
Okay. Um, why don't we take a five minute break? Take a five minute break and um, come on back. I want to start getting in the soils. Okay. So see you in five minutes. So Patrick, what do you see? Still looking at your presenter view. Damn. <laughs> Got to work on this. Hold on. There's only so many permutations. What do you see now? Uh, you got it. Okay. Soil. Soil layers. I also Soil see, layers. I with see your a pictures on, on top, right? Yep. Your pictures are gone. Michael, the the zoning that you were talking about earlier um having that data would that be a way to kind of i mean i, I guess it strikes me that just because zoning is done that doesn't mean that development has happened in all those plots but uh knowing the zoning codes would allow you to basically do a worst case scenario we're going to talk about zoning. we're going to do some analyses down at the parcel level um oh, cool. okay later yeah you know, we're looking at multiple scales of the watershed. So, um, um, but one way to do it is, is instead of drilling down, you could just get on and, you know, or use your DeLorme map and just count the number of dots uh -huh. and then apply, you know, a, a formula for, you know, I showed you a formula for forest and I showed you a formula for, uh, impervious surface right you could do one for grass one for water and then all you do is you have the number and so you would just and you would you know 
that's the zoned, let's say half acre, so you multiply everything by half acre, every building by half acre, that gives you the total number of acres, and then you, then you apply the formula to get the percentage of cover type. Does that make sense? So it's another way if you don't have, you know, if you're just using a Delorme in the field, you could do a really, really quick and dirty. Okay, so I think I've, until next time, I think I've conquered the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so I know Dave has had soils because a third of the wetlands ecology course has to deal with soils, okay? So who else has been in depth in soils? Speak up or hold your peace. Jack? I've uh, played around with the uh, soil survey website functioning and doing some restoration plantings, but that's about it. Okay, so I'm on the PowerPoint that says Lane's Balance. Just to give you a heads up. So um, for people who haven't been involved with soils, basically soils uh, profiles have horizons and the primary horizons are A, B, and C, okay? Above the A horizon, we have something that's known as the O horizon. And really what that is is organic matter that came from leaves or whatever fell off last year. So it's primarily decomposing organics. The A horizon is a mixture of the parent material that is in New England, it's post-glacial, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, and, and the organics. As you move down to the B horizon, it has a lot less organics and you're moving into much more parent material and C is the parent material. And so when you look at a soil survey, it will say, it'll give you three numbers. It'll go zero to four inches and then it'll go from four, you know, four inches to 12 inches. And what they're doing is giving you the horizon thicknesses. Now, if you take my wetlands course or you take uh, um, Rachel Theat's soils ecology course in the spring, you'll find out there's a lot more nuance to these, these, these layers. But this is not a soils course, so we're not going beyond that. Any questions about that? Okay. Mm -hmm. So O is the top layer of the ABC strata? Yeah, so A is always the top layer. Again, above that, soil scientists you know, designate O, which is just the last year's you know, litter, okay? And in wetland scientists, the O horizon um, is really important. <laughs> um, but don't worry about that, okay? So, the things that create soil is parent material, okay, which is underneath the soil, relief, because that has to do with how long water sticks, sticks around, okay, and its relationship of water to the soils is big. The organisms in the soils themselves, because the organisms not only disturb the soil, but they bring oxygen down to, into the layers of the soil, and Oxygen in the soil actually impacts the chemistry of the soil. Climate, obviously, how wet, how dry, how variable, going from a saturated situation to an aerated situation, you know, from you know late spring until midsummer, going back and forth is going to have a big impact on the soil chemistry. And then obviously time. Okay, so these are the parameters that impact what you see as a soil profile. Okay. And so if you just sort of look at a, what is known as a soil series, you'll get all different types of looking soils. Okay, and that really has to do with all the, how all those parameters, those, you know, those five parameters I talked about interact with each other. Down here you notice this is close to water, okay? The first one, 
way over here. I guess I can go underneath it. It actually doesn't have much of a horizon. It doesn't have much of an A, B, or C horizon. It pretty much has an O horizon, which is at the top where you see the plants. And it has a C horizon. And the reason being is the place floods all the time. So that you don't have enough time for something to really develop A, B, and C. It's continually getting new C all the time, unless you get that. You get up here in the highlands, um, which is one, two, three, the fourth one over, you can see you get a classic mature soil, an A, B, and C. Okay, and then you get the stuff in between. I won't go into why that happens, but just realize this, these are pretty much the same soil texture and structure texture, but you see a lot of different views of it because of where it is on the landscape and how the glacier and post-glacial um, activities interacted with that landscape. And so first is, unless you're at the top of the watershed where bedrock is the parent material in New England, all the stuff that you see in soils is a result of the advancement of glaciers and the receding of glaciers. So all these are basically where the glacier was at different times in the past and they're in thousands of years. And so if you go up here to Keene, which is here, the, glacier, the glacial front sort of receded about 13,000 years ago, okay? Down here, um, uh, you also had different glacial advances. So some of these things down here in Long Island in Cape Cod were a result of a couple of different glacial advances, but way out here, which you can't see the number at the very tip, it's probably where, gee, it's gotta be where East Ham or, or Wellfleet is. It's, it's the number is 4,200. So the glacier only went away from there 4,200 years ago <laughs> because there was another advance and they didn't come down completely all the same way. So this is just the advancement of, of the glaciers. Okay. And at the end of each of these points where it advanced, it basically dropped a whole bunch of stuff out at the end. These are called moraines and they're unsorted. They're all big rocks to small silts. And underneath the glacier is the same material, but you had a two mile high wall of ice on top of it two miles high, compress that, okay? So this is very compressed. If you've ever worked with a backhoe operator and, and he's digging away and all of a sudden he goes, damn, what he's hit is hard pan. He calls it hard pan. It's glacial till and it will break the teeth off his, off his bucket. And that's why he says, damn, because he has to keep replacing it to dig down through it. And so one of the things you see you get on the landscape is you get this really unsorted type of material. It has cobblestones um, all the way down to very compressed material. And a lot of times this is the sea horizon, okay, in certain parts of the landscape. And then you also, post-glacial, you've got these low, huge glacial lakes. Here's Keene right here. Here's Brattleboro, okay. Way up here is Lancaster. Where's Barry? St. John's Barry. So Montpelier is right here. So for you, Patrick, right across this lake extended all the way up. And this lake, if you'll look, extended all the way up to here. This is called Lake Hitchcock, okay. Also in Keene, there's a much smaller lake called Lake Ashwila, but this is the largest lake. And this lake was caused by an ice block breaking off a two mile high glacier and getting stuck in some bedrock narrows down at Windsor Locks, Connecticut. Okay. And this lake, basically, that's the extent of the lake, but the ice block would break up and the part of the lake would disappear and then another ice block would come in and create another part of the lake. But this just shows you how extensive this lake was. And so when you get this kind of situation, it gets water 
behind it. And then you have runoff from the uplands coming into it, okay? You have fast moving water, fast moving water carrying very large stone, very large, and then it starts to flatten out. And the large particles drop out when the water starts to slow down, okay? And then it gets a little flatter and a little flatter and you've lost all your large particles and then you got smaller particles like stone and pebbles. And then all of a sudden the water hits, this stream water hits this glacial lake and boom, everything drops out because the velocity stops. Does that make sense? And so that's called sorting where you got the coarser material further upstream and the finest material downstream. And so up these valleys, like the valleys you're mapping for your, for your uh, systems, you will have sorted material. You'll find coarse, so, coarse materials up here as well as coarse soil materials up here. And as you get down towards your mouth, you'll it'll get finer and finer, so your soil types will change. Now the ice block disappears. And into that valley, you basically will get these deltas where, where rivers meet lakes or rivers meet oceans, and they form these big deltas. And these deltas are usually the same amount of material because they got dropped out all at the same, out at the same time. And so coming off these streams into a old glacial lake or into a bigger valley, which is usually the next order stream, right? Okay, you'll have a soil set of soils that are, they're not sort, you know, they're, they're basically, this, they're not unmixed. I mean, they're not mixed, they're unmixed, they're sorted, so that you'll get the same type of things. And even some of the stuff sloughs down into the valley. That's what this, these are. And then you can't read this really, so it says varved. And what the varved is, V-A-R-V-E-D, this little, these areas right here, what that is, is the finest material is silts and clays. The clays are really, really small particles, so they will stay suspended in the water. And if the water is continually disturbed by, let's say, wind action, they won't settle out. But if they got to a part of the glacial lake where, you know, like a cove or something where it's really quiet water, they will settle out and you get these layer upon layers of these silts and clays and they creates a varved clay, which is almost impermeable to water. And as an aside, this is where people like to cite landfills. So the leachate, so the leachate doesn't, you know, they'll put a liner underneath the landfill, but the safety margin is the varved clay underneath the landfill. That's just an aside. So does anybody have a question about that? So these are the glacial type of things that create the different kinds of soils. And so just remember, fast moving water can move large material, both in bulk and in size of particle. As the thing, as the slope flattens, the velocity of the water slows down and it, it, all the bigger materials drop out and it will carry smaller materials like gravels and stone. And then when it hits a body of water, it will drop out all its fines. And so you'll get a lot of sands. And the very finest material will float around in the water until it settles out, which will take a long time. And then you'll get your silts and your clays. So when, it, when we talk about texture, clay, silt, very fine sand, fine sand, coarse sand, stone, pebble, stone, rock, boulder. These are all texture classes, and, and all those indicate the velocity of water that set them down post-glacial. And the other stuff post-glacial is just that till, that stuff that was underneath, underneath the glacier and you won't find them in the valley. You'll find it in the valleys, but it'll be underneath all this stuff because the glacier had already receded. But you definitely will find it near the surface how higher and higher you get into the watershed because, you know, the lakes didn't go up there or the glacial rivers didn't go up there. Okay. 
The other thing that really impacts soils is, is primarily where moisture is and how long it stays there. So, so you have these zones and this basically is the water table and the water table will fluctuate based on the time of year, the climate, you know, drought, saturation. And that zone uh, fluctuation is known as the model zone. And don't worry about it, it's just what we call it, the model zone, okay? And so that may show up in the B horizon, it may show up even in the C horizon, it depends on where you are. Way up here, you can see the distance from the surface is much further away. So this would probably be in the C horizon here. But as you get down, the way water move flows down to a stream, this zone gets closer and closer to the surface, so it, show, it may show up in the B horizon or even the A horizon. And this zone really impacts how fast the soil, how fast the parent material breaks down. Water, oxygen, and freezing are the three things that can break down parent material faster. All right, can you say that again, the, the part before that you followed with about the parent material? It's basically where water fluctuates between dry and wet, the model zone, the water table zone, that, will, that is the place where the parent material is broken down the fastest so that you get your your mature soils, the ABC horizon, right? It does it chemically when you're switching between oxygenated and anaerobic or aerobic, anaerobic, or oxygenated, saturated. That's a chemical breakdown, okay? And don't worry about that. You'll get more of that if you take wetlands or soil ecology. It breaks it down mechanically because if it freezes, the cracks open and then it, when it cracks open, little pieces break off. And so the more freezing you get, the, the more you get mechanical breakdown. Does that make sense? Yep, thank you. Okay, so that's your soils course. Okay, that's it. So I'm going to uh, real quickly go to the soil survey because this is where your homework's gonna be. Uh, remember I showed you the soil survey that you can get out of a book. Every county has, and I talked about it last week. And so here, here's the website. And so um, let me share, stop sharing and reshare a screen. Okay, which way do I go to go there? So stop sharing. Okay. And open that up. I'll stop sharing again. Hopefully you'll, we'll get here to where I am. What do you see? What are you looking at? Web soil survey um, homepage, it looks like. And is your pictures there? It's you mean our faces for the video? No, just your desktop. Just my desktop, okay. Can you see your pictures now? I just wanna see what screen you're looking at. No, nope. we're looking at just the window of your browser. The window of my browser, okay, great. So, which means I can get it on my browser. Okay, I just want to show you, you're going to be doing, using this browser um, for your exercise, you know, for your homework. So you go here and you start the web soil survey, which I just did. Is it changing for you? Do you see a map of the U.S.? Yep. Okay. So, um, so what I'm going to do is... Uh, in search, I'm just going to put uh, Keene, New Hampshire. No match. Enter keywords. Basic search. Keene, New Hampshire. Clear. 
advanced search, all keywords. I think I'll go here and just click on it. It's the fastest way. I'm clicking on it, click on it, click on it, click on it. Okay, Bennington, Cheshire, click. Keen, Keen. Okay, I want to go out one, go out another one, go out one more. Okay. Now, let me, uh, there. Okay. Let me go someplace that you've been before. Okay. So here's the White Brook, here's Hurricane Brook. Remember the first example we used at the first day was Hurricane Brook. So I'm gonna go into Hurricane Brook. Okay, so this is Hurricane Brook. Here's the White Brook. This is the thing we did the first day, you know, when I was showing you how to delineate, was this right here. And so, um, what I wanna do is, is to create a soil, uh, a profile. I'm just centering it a little better. Okay. Okay, there we go. So, um, over here, there's two things that are called O A O I. Does everyone see that? A O I. That means area of interest. One creates a rectangle, one creates your own form okay so the one you want to do uh to create the polygon is the one that looks like a polygon and not like a rectangle okay and so uh, i click on that and then what it does as you know <laughs> so i'm going to roughly outline the watershed as we originally did it okay because i can see the slope pretty well Okay, and then I double clicked. So it's creating the AOI. So let me go out one. Okay, so it created this AOI right there, okay? Now I can use whatever I want. And so I was in the area interest tab up here. Now I go to the soil map. See soil map tab at the top? I click the soil map. It's now created a soil map. Let me go in. Let me just make sure I, there it is. Okay, get closer, close. Close, give me a sec. My dog's persistent at scratching the paint off my door. Okay, so, so right now, this is as close as I can get. Um, actually, I know I can get closer. I just did. I don't know what happens, but you can get pretty close. I lost it. Okay, there it is. Okay, so that's my soil map. And that's just a section of the soil map. I have a hand here. I can move it around. Um, Okay, now the soil map has numbers. See 76C, 76D. See those numbers? Okay. Now remember what I told you about hydrologic soil groups, A, B, C, and D? This number isn't that. 
you can use you can go into the soil mapper and you and find those hydrologic soil categories and i'll show you where you start to look for details but that's the steepness so 76d is a pretty steep soil okay which makes sense it's coming off the top of the you know here 76 c is a little flatter soil 22 b over here is is a very flat soil and then there's a which is almost completely flat okay so so um that that's all it's telling you it's, it's showing you the topography but over here on this table it shows you the map number everyone see this these are all the soils that i just did monadnock we saw monadnock in one of our examples it gives you the acres uh, of that soil on the in the watershed or in your AOI. It gives you the percent of that soil type. And let's go to Monadnock since we played with it on a on a runoff. Um, um, we'll go to Monadnock C. If I click double click, you see Monadnock. It says fine sandy loam what that means it's mostly fine sand in the sea horizon the b horizon is also a lot of sand and the a horizon has more organics in it so it's telling you it's a sandy soil but it's a fine sandy soil so imagine pouring some water on it what would it do it would go down through it right the loam is telling you that there's a little bit of silt and clay in there if it was just a fine sandy soil, it would just say fine sandy. But the loam means there's a little bit of silt and clay, which means that the water doesn't go down as fast if it was just fine sandy, okay? And then it gives you the slope, eight to 15%. A C slope is eight to 15% slope. And it says it's very stony. Okay, so that's the quick and dirty. And if you double click on this, on the soil description, it's loading it. Taking a while. Well, it may not come up and we may have to move on, but basically what it will do is give you the description that's found in the soil county survey, which is very detailed. There it is. Okay. So it's, it's, it says, you know, here's the setting where you find these soils, mountains and hills, landform position, that is, you know, where is it's the back slope, summit and shoulders of those. Okay. Soil profile, here's a typical profile of Monadnock and see all these, it has the organic lens and E, don't worry about it, but it has two, B, three B horizons, four B horizons, okay, and a C. It doesn't have an A horizon, that's because it's E, and I'm not gonna go into that, so I call it an Albic horizon, remember that, Dave, Albic? And then it gives you all these properties. It gives you minor components. What this means, now look, just let you know that the mapping of the soils um, have a certain precision and accuracy. They field test some of it, but they also uh, use satellite imagery to, to map it, okay? And so there's a certain precision and accuracy. And so within that, you could have these other soil types. That's all that's saying. Though it's primarily monadnock soil. So that's what it is. When I double clicked on it, it gave you the soil type. And then I can go to uh, Soil Data Explorer. And if you look down on this little table here, it has a lot of details. And these are big tables that are found in the back of the soil survey. It gives you, you know, soil appropriateness for building, construction, disaster recovery, 
It gives you soil based on land classification, land management. What's the be, you know what's the best land management? Is it appropriate for military operations? Sorry. Um, sanitary facilities. What that means is septic systems. Okay. Uh, soil health, and then it has, uh, you know, its characteristics for, you know, is it good for vegetation? Is it good for waste management? And what, what are, what is its hydrologic characteristics? That's what water, water management is. Okay, so, so if I just go to building a construction site, I click on it, then it has a whole lot of subcategories. Is it good for shallow excavations? And what you do is you, you know, let's just do shallow excavations. I'm gonna click on that. Okay. Is that just gonna be like a basement for a residence or something? Yeah, and so I'm gonna see here, I'm gonna say view rating. And for some reason, it's, it's soil web mapper is slow today. So it can create a whole bunch of different kinds of maps for you besides just the soil map for its appropriateness. But you also, you can see uh, while we're it's downloading, okay, so there. So what it does is it gives you a color code. Red is it's bad for shallow excavations. Green means it's good and yellow means it's in between. And then you can actually print out that map or download that map and put it in a Word, Excel, or PowerPoint. Okay. Now if we go down underneath it, it has a table. And if we go to our Monadnock soils down here, Bottom. So Monadnock soils, eight to 15 percent slope. It's somewhat limited for shallow excavations for a basement, for example. Okay. Um, Monadnock soils make up 81 percent of your watershed. So if you're going to if you're going to develop your watershed into parcels, you know you would say, well, most of it is, you know, I you know I can put in. How's, how footprints with a shallow basement, okay? And it gives you the slope and some other characteristics on these tables, okay? Acres, AOI, percent of AOI, which you've got something else. So there's a lot of information here, a lot, a lot. It's, it's as, as, as much as is in, um, let's see if I got a soil survey right here. Yeah. Okay. Nope. My soil surveys are underneath my screen, holding my screen up. So, uh, such is life. So, it's all the same information that you'll get in a county soil survey, and all this information on all these tables here. Okay. Soil health, everything is in tables in the back of the soil county survey as tables. Okay, so that's just a real quick and dirty of the soil mapper. You're gonna to need to play with it. You do have an assignment that's gonna ask you to find certain things and upload the maps as well as the tables into a Word document. Okay, I just want you to get comfortable with that. Any questions? Okay, so stop share. So oh, there you go. Make that small. Okay. Okay. Save. Share. Okay.
me share screen. Going back to my uh, PowerPoint. Hopefully I'll find it. So what are you looking at? Got a map with a unit legend. Okay, okay. So that's where we just were. So let's start to get into how you how we're going to uh, determine how much soil we've determined how much water comes off the landscape. The question is how much soil comes off the landscape. Okay. And when we get into water quality, there's a strong relationship between soil and phosphorus. Okay. And so this is a this is a hydrograph. Remember we talked about a hydrograph? You know, basically you have a rainfall event, it goes up, and then it goes down over time. Okay. The thing about uh, this hydrograph is uh, this is bank full discharge and it has the water going over the bank. But this hydrograph also has sediment discharge because water moves materials. The faster the water, the larger material and also the greater the mass of the material. So with every flood, and actually when you consider the economic impacts of flood, it's not water, it's soil. That has the greatest impact on infrastructure. Not only does it take a lot of time to remove it, but it also creates a lot of damage because you have water moving a mass, right? And because it's moving a mass, okay, it has a force. And so if it has a force, it hits something that won't let it through or knock it down or destroy it. And so the soil, in a large event is, is the most dangerous part of a flood. Okay. Let me just move that back up there. So this is just showing you, um, the picture at the bottom is I, I took, I was doing restoration on the White River in Vermont of houses, mostly low income houses and trailer parks that were hit by uh, the flood of uh, Superstorm Irene. Okay, most of the work we did for the first two weeks is this. Okay, and these are, this is low, mostly low income housing because that's where they can afford to live is right next to the, the river. Okay. The remaining three months of work and we had to get funding was basically mold removal. And that was because of the water. This is basically a, a aerial photograph of Long Island Sound 18 hours after Irene hit Vermont. Okay, so it just gives you an idea how much sediment load was coming down with that flood wave. And just imagine this is a glacial lake you basically have a lot of sediment, very, you know, sands and stuff are dropping out right here. And then the really fine materials floating out and, and then it'll settle out later on if that was a lake. But it's an ocean and because of ocean currents, it's gonna be moved away. So what is erosion? At its simplest point, erosion is a drop hitting water hitting soil that's saturated. That's hitting soil that's saturated. The water creates a whole bunch of droplets of water with soil in it going up. And because you're on a slope, the majority of those droplets are gonna fall downhill. So really at the micro scale, it's just this little process of droplets carrying water up into the air and because of gravity, it drops a little further downhill and that's what erosion is. Just multiply it by an infinite number of times that comes with a large rainstorm. Okay. 
So when we look at our landscape, the drivers for erosion, the greatest erosion obviously is gonna be at the areas with the steepest slope. So this is known as the erosion zone or the source zone. You'll get sorting of material as the slope basically reduces, you'll get sorting of material, Tr sediments being transported down the slopes, down these slopes into the main column the main column may be moving at a higher velocity than these little teeny columns based on the amount of water. And then you get into the really flat area and you can see the, how, the, how the stream starts to meander and then you get the deltas. Okay, so, so this is the carving zone, this is the deposition zone. Okay, all watersheds, whether micro, macro, or whole river basins have this. So when we go back to our morphometric indicators that we talked about, the three that are really going to be that drive erosion in your watershed and to assess how erosive your watershed may be outside of the soil types is the basin relief. And basin relief is what you calculate. It's the highest point minus the lowest point and thus it's the percentage slope. It's the drainage density, it's the length of the stream channel per unit area of watershed. So you have to figure out how many, how, what's the length divided by the area of your watershed and that will give you the drain density. And then the real most important parameter is known as ruggedness, which is just BH times DD gives you RN, and that RN number will give you uh, the complexity of the terrain, but it really, the higher the number, the higher potential for your, to have erosion in your basin or sub-basin or even a sub-sub catchment, because they all will have different RNs, you know, based on what they are. You said the higher the number, the greater chance of erosion. Erosion, happens. yep. It's a comparative analysis, right? You're comparing that side of your, your watershed to that, this side of your watershed. Or you know, you're comparing the highest point of your watershed to your lowest part of your watershed. Which parts are gonna have the highest erosion potential? Okay. Uh, I think I already, oh, what I did is I just moved all these things. So. What is soil erosion here? So, you know, soil erosion is there. Okay, I'm trying to get this into something else so it's out of the way. Okay. Let's see. There, okay. Erosion is the wearing away of material by wind, water, ice, or other things. So you can have, we're, we're pretty much interested in water erosion. There's some wind erosion around here. There's definitely ice erosion along uh, stream banks and also in um, uh, coastal uh, salt marshes, there's ice erosion. Um, but primarily water erosion is, is what we're looking at. So there's three types of erosion that we consider Sheet erosion, where water's moving in a uniform thin layer, it's usually the highest point of the watershed starts with sheet erosion. Real erosion is numerous and ran randomly occurring small channels and that occurs in your, um, your seasonal streams. And then you have gully erosion, which is deep erosion, which becomes your stream channel, okay? So, Sheet erosion, this is just what it looks like. And if you look at, if you didn't have vegetation cover, this is pretty much what it would look like. A soil would have been, the easier soil to move would have been moved away and the harder to move soil would have stayed. And so that's what these little plateaus are. Then you get uh, real erosion. And so real erosion is just, you know, you can see all these things up here of a non-vegetated slope and how it happens. Now realize 
the coarser the material, the harder it is to erode. So if you have soils that are sand and you have a certain size storm and you have sand on this part of your water, on one side of your watershed and you have silts and, and, and loam on the other part of your watershed, same storm event, the silts and loams are gonna move off the watershed much faster and much easier than the sands. And then once you start to get a, a rill that's right here, once you start to get a gully, the sides get steeper. And once you increase the, the sides, the, obviously the slopes are getting steeper, which means the water's moving faster. And so you, once you start this process, it speeds up. It's almost exponential. And you get these large gullies that occur. And here's a perfect example where way up here, over here in this picture, you probably are getting a sheet erosion and then rill erosion. And then you start to get these little rills right here. And then all of a sudden you get this gully erosion. Okay. And so you can change a whole landscape. And if you've ever fly, flown across the United States, look down and you can see all the different spatial patterns on the landscape as a result of, land, of water meeting soils. It's really interesting. Um, to watch while you're flying across the country. Okay. Any questions? I kind of okay. wonder. I wonder if every, if that's an if that's like a developmental process of erosion, like across the board, or if one of those. It is. It is that you'll you'll have sheet you'll have sheet flow starting, and it'll eventually eventually if it, if the rate of precipitation or the variability of precipitation is the same, it will eventually move into gully unless you stabilize the slopes with vegetation. So that's what's so bad about forest fires right now in the West is that you're removing all the vegetation and then in come late winter when the, uh, especially in California, when you basically are getting the, the storms coming off the uh, Pacific, you're going to get heavy rainfalls and then at the end of the spring you're going to get the big snow melts and you're there's no vegetation stabilizing the soil and you're going to start this process where you're going to get these huge huge gullies of erosion and sometimes you actually get uh, the whole slope uh collapsing depending on how wet the soil gets so um so this is just basically data it basically gives you uh, so you can come up with an idea of, of what speed of water carries what size particles. So these are all, all these dots are different studies, okay? And they, they're studies of different size particles versus different velocities of water, okay? So this is just the kind of data they get. And what they do is they create these sort of engineering tables where they have average velocity of water here. And then it has, these are different types of soils, the finest to the courses way over here. And then it'll show you when these particles start to erode at what velocity. Okay. And then it'll also show you at which velocity they will start to deposit. Okay. And obviously these are inverse relationships. You go from fine to coarse, and then, and then, um, and then you go from uh, fine to coarse is settling out. So you get these different curves going this way, but all you have to do is get an idea. And this is all just showing that different velocity of water carry has, does a, we call this work in, in physics. The higher velocity of the water, the more work it can do, and that's the more carving it can do and the more carrying it can do. So when I do say velocity, water does work, that's what I'm meaning. And then Lane back in 1955 and followed by Rogen created this thing called Lane's balance, that there's a relationship between soil movement or dis disposal and water. So if you add, let's say you add more water coming down the, the, the watershed, what would create more water coming down the watershed? Anybody answer that. You have to turn on your slope. Slope. No, the slope would probably stay the same unless you got a big excavator in there and changed it. So 
what what else would change the amount of water coming down the watershed? Temperature, like uh, melt, snow melt. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. I guess where where the variability of temperature is shifting because of climate change. So yeah, you know where you normally you'd have a glacier. Event. What? You're talking about the size of the rain event, like how extreme the storm is or how intense the storm is? Right. So the extreme of storm or more melting, or let's just say you built more impervious surface on your watershed. So less infiltration. More water would come down the watershed. So if you put more water on the watershed and, it's, and it weights this side of the scale, okay, what's this side of the scale over here going to do? It's going to go up, right? Well, nature ab abhors non-equilibrium. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. It does not like a non-equilibrium situation. So what it's going to do is going to try to go back into equilibrium. In order for this scale that got lifted up here on the left-hand side to go up, to come back down, what do you need? To slow the flow? No, just to bring this down on this side. We knew it took more water. This goes down, this would go up, right? How would, what, what, what would nature do to tr get back into equilibrium? Slow the speed of water? Yes, it would, but indirectly. What it would do is it would carve more soil out that water, that more of that water coming down the watershed would do more work and put more soil coming down as erosion or sediment and fill up this side of the, of the scale so it would balance, okay? And so that's pretty much what Lane's balance does is basically if you add more water, the scale tips, but then you can change these little things and change slope now, if we change slope and made slope move this out here and made slope greater, what would happen to the scale? This would drop, right? So the watershed would, would basically do more work to try to offset that by basically moving more material down. Okay, so if you did change your slope, it would, it would even out. And let me give you some examples of that of Lane's balance, and you see it every day. You just don't know what you're looking at. Velocity of water versus particle size. This is a perfect example of Lane's balance. Water, there's, there's obviously impervious surface as a result of this new construction. More water's running off. More water running off, a higher volume of water, possibly a higher velocity of water. It's going to do work, work in order to create an equilibrium in this micro, micro, micro watershed. <laughs> what you see in stream banks, if a higher velocity of water is coming down, it's going to start carving the stream bank to offset that velocity of water with more sediment. Here's a big one. This is, the, this is basically the Merrimack River. They basically plowed the field right to the edge of the riverbank. No trees to stabilize the water. Started as, as, as a sheet erosion, went to rill erosion, went to gully erosion, and then slope collapsed because of the steepness. This is Lane's balance. How is that going to create equilibrium? It looks like that that's destroyed the ability of no, because land what, to what is back. done. You see that delta out there? The delta is yep. expanding as the water comes down this steep slope. What does it start to do? Flattens out. It slows out, down, yeah. And it drops out material. So that carving basically was changed to a deposition. And it, it basically changes the dynamic on the soil side of the balance. Okay, does that make sense, Dave? Yes. Okay. So we've already seen this. 
your DPW offsets this, basically. <laughs> you know, they said, well, the velocity of water coming off this slope is causing a lot of erosion, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna change the mass of the soil particles. We're gonna put much larger soil particles. It takes much, fat, much more velocity of water to move those, so I've just changed the whole dynamic right here by putting in these, uh, God, these are, whew. usually they put in three inch stone. These are foot stone. <laughs> so all these things right here, even the natural meander of rivers and the carving and creating the switchbacks on rivers is, a, is this concept. Let me give you a really interesting example. Um, in 2014, we had what was called the Mother's Day flood on the coast of New Hampshire. It was in early May, all the ground underneath the forested areas was still frozen. Okay, so it was like impervious surface. And we had this huge rain event. And we have what's known as the Sun Cook River, which is right here this little black line, okay? This is where it is in the, in the uh, relationship of New Hampshire. And this is the Sun Cook, okay? And the blue is the original river. The yellow, after the storm, was the new river. It just shows you the scale of what a, a runoff event can do depending on the soil type and the slopes. So this is really interesting. A lot of people's property deeds said that the edge of their ownership of property was to the center of the river. So there is a big mess of court cases going on right now okay, in Rockingham County around what happened in 2014 of who owns what. So that's just an aside. So uh, why don't we take a five minute break, come back and we're gonna do what's called the Soil Conservation Service runoff to do the math, to calculate the runoff and it's math, but it's pretty straightforward math. Okay, it's just multiplication. And it's almost, it's similar to what you did for runoff, but instead of just coming up with a number using a graph or a formula, you actually are gonna do a calculation. Okay, so come on back in five minutes. Jack, you still there? Just letting you know that we're going to be cut out in like 10 minutes. Okay. You're done your part? Um, we're not completely done. We'll be done with it tomorrow, but we
we have to wait for the electrician to speak. Okay. Okay. Great. So what time you're going to come as early as you did today? Yeah, probably like seven, seven fifteen. Great. Sounds good. All right. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. All right. See you tomorrow. Okay. Have take care. Night. Hi, Shamika. I can't hear you. Turn on your, turn on your volume. You done with work? No, I was on the call for this last uh, two or three PowerPoints. You two, like PowerPoint you just went through and the soil um, mm -hmm. mapper online. Um, but I had to keep my video off during that time because when the screen is shared, it's taking up too much bandwidth. But I wanted to pop on video to let you know I was there for that part. And I asked um, Patrick to take notes for me for the first part and um, to handle this last part. And then I see your recording. So I'm just going to rewatch it anyway. Okay. So, um, so there's two times this is going to happen, right? Yes. And I'm actually trying to move the one on the first. It just happens to be a north... Eastern. Actually, I think on ten one, I don't think we have class. Oh, okay. That is I correct. Ten one, we don't have class on the syllabus. Thank you. Okay. I just assumed the only date we didn't have class was going to be on Thanksgiving. So that too. That edit. That too. Thank you kindly. That's is that all classes or just ours? Just just yours because you have some field work to do, and I wanted to give you more time. Okay. Okay. So no official class field work. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to turn the video back off um, so I can pop in when I can. But uh, the last remainder of this, I have to join that other meeting. Okay. No, I understand that. Thank you so very thank, much. You. thank you. Kindly. And I will. Uh, what I'm going to do is upload the recording as a YouTube and then I'll send it to you and Jack. Actually, I'll put it on the resource folder for everyone as a YouTube in case okay. they want to see it again. I don't normally record, you know, three hours of video. <laughs> <Classic>. video. <laughs> but, it's um, a lot. It's a lot. So, okay. I Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Getting some work done there, Michael? No, what I'm doing is I'm trying to bring up another PowerPoint. Oh, I meant the, the dude, <laughs> your little pop-in. You mentioned the electricians and my ears perked up. Oh, yeah, I'm getting um, some uh, splits put in. So uh, that's the engineering firm that's putting in the heat pumps. So... Um, and since I have solar, they, you know, the energy is going to be minimal running them. So what are you guys seeing right now? You just seeing the mountains? Indeed. Yes. Lovely view of the mountains. Now what are you seeing? Uh, soil loss procedure. Okay. Letters. We, sh we shall begin. And, and Jack, we're on the soil loss procedure PowerPoint. Roger that. Okay. So it's a straight mathematical calculation. The question is, where do you get all these things? It's the area that is, you know, basically the tons of soil lost per year. That's what A means. And it times these factors. And it's just multiplication. This times that times that times that times that. Okay. To let you know, because this was created for the agricultural community and, and for 
uh, avoiding erosion on agricultural fields. I'll tell you this at the beginning of the end, for the, our work, you will P right here, the P will always be one. Okay. So for all the work you do, the P is one because you're not doing contour erosion control or any of the things that the P changes for. Okay, so you keep it as one. So I'm gonna go down through this and just go through this process and then give you an assignment or an in-class exercise to see if you can figure it out as a group. Okay, so um, let's begin. So this is the example. Okay, so we'll come back to it, but just sort of keep this in mind. This example is based on a 2.5 acre parcel. This is not a watershed. This is a piece of property. And as I told Patrick, we're gonna be going up and down in scales on the watershed. And then that, we're at the parcel scale right now. That is a piece of land someone owns. Okay, assume 100% is wooded, okay. The soil type is a Monadnock complex MWB. What's this B mean? Steepness. And what does B mean since we talked about it? Good soil, not the best, but. It's basically eight to 15% slope. Oh, okay, okay. Right? Yep. A is, is, is a zero to eight, B yep. is eight to 15, C is 15 to 25, D is 25 to 50, and E is greater than 50% slope. We're talking uh, cathedral ledges or El Capitan is E soils. Okay. Uh, the average depth of the soil ranges from two to 36 inches. And within that uh, range, you have an A, B, and C horizon. The slope is 200 feet. I mean, the slope length is 200 feet. And the slope gradient rise over run is 5%. So all this should make sense to you now that you've done your morphometry on your own watersheds, right? Okay. P will always equal one. So just remember that we got a Monadnock soil, 100% wooded, slope length of 200 feet, 5% uh, gradient with a 2.5%. So, so as we go down and just to go back, we're gonna look for R, K, L, S, C, P is always one. Okay. Okay. So this is a map, okay? It's known as the Rainfall Erosivity Index. Who has these maps? The Soil Conservation Service, now known as the Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS. And so where you get this information is off the NRCS websites, okay? Now what this is is showing you what the R factor is, and it's really based on rainfall, what the R factor is in different parts of the country. But it's a little more complicated than rainfall. It's rainfall, slope, and, and a major soil type that gives you the erosivity factor. The, and it's known as the R factor, which is different from the K factor. We're going to talk about both. The R factor is the aerial, that is the basin level of erosivity. And so that numbers are on the contours. And so for Keene, okay, for Keene, which is about, it's not on 125, it's just below 125, it's about 120. Okay, so for Keene, let me see if I can get rid of these things. Okay, back, backspace. Okay, it's 120, okay? And I'll just let you know it's 120. And so that's the R, so you get it off this map. So if you're gonna do these calculations, use this map. You can also get maps that are much more detailed for the regions like the Northeast region, but 
This is the simplest map you can use. So 120. Now the K, you can get the K from your soil county survey. There's a table in the back, and I don't know why it's doing this, but basically um, the Monadnock soils are right there. Okay, so the K factor is in this column right here in the soil count of survey, but because you can get the K factor in a soil survey, it's also on the soil web survey, and it's under water management. That's where you're gonna find K for your soil type. So what I often do is I always go to the B horizon and so if I look at the Monadnock soil here, here's the Monadnock, here's the B horizon, the middle set of numbers, that's how thick it is. Right there is the K value. So the K value for this Monadnock soil is 0.28. Now, the next thing we're going to look at is what's known as the LS factor. It's known as the length slope factor. And so you need both the length and the slope. So what is the length I gave you? Do you remember? On the problem? 200 feet. And what was the slope? 5%. Okay, that's just the hypothetical. So the way you use this table is very similar to the way you use your CN table for runoff. You find on the x-axis the slope length, which is 200, okay? And the 5%, so there's the 200. It goes up to the 5% slope curve, you see it? And it goes over to the y-axis and you get 0.8. The LS factor is 0.8. Okay, does that make sense? Now you can do this mathematically and it's a little more complicated math formula than I showed you for runoff. This is it. So basically this is a, is a character for the slope length and it's in feet. Okay, M, okay, right there, which is an exponent. Okay is a number, it's, it's not a percentage, but if you look over here, if, if M is 0.5, if S is 5% or greater. So we had a 5% slope, so our M is gonna be 0.5. But if it's, it can be 0.4 if the slope is 4% and 0.3 if it's 3% or less, okay? So my M up here, what I would put in, I'd put in my 200 in here and I'd put in my 5, 0.5 up here, right? And then I have to figure out what the X is. Now the X is a little bit of trigonometry. X is the, the sign of the angle of the slope. And so you don't have to worry about figuring out the trigonometry, but in an Excel, if you put in this formula, right here, equals S-I-N, parentheses, capital A-T-A-N, parentheses, and then you put your rise over your run, okay, which would be your fraction of your percentage, parentheses, parentheses, that will give you your X, and then you put X into that formula, okay? So that's, that is the formula in Excel to get the X, or basically to get the sign of the angle. But you can just, um, also use this table. <laughs> You can either use the graph, you can do the math, or you can use this table. 
And if we look at 200 feet, and we look at slope of 5%, we get 0.7582. And on the graph, you got 0.8, which is just rounding it. Right? So it's pretty much the same number. So finally, the C. So we got our R, K, L, L and S gave us our L, S. The C, what did we say was the cover type? Forest. 100% forest, tree canopy, okay? So if I go up here and I see tree canopy 100 to 75%, and I see that I don't have any grazing or burning control of that forest. I'm not doing, you know, fire ecology or not, you know, have animals underneath there. The C factor is what? It's 0 0.001. And so now I have my C. And since P is always one, now I just basically multiply that, those things together. So 120 times 0.28 times 0.8 times 0 0.001 times one. And that gives me 0 0.027 tons per acre per year soil loss. That's per acre. That's what happens when you, you get a you know, a forested situation. And it, since it's 2.5 acres, you're getting about 0 0.067 tons of soil loss per year. And that is primarily sheet erosion. Okay. Does that make sense, everyone? Questions yeah. about that? This is the time to ask. Okay. Okay, now write this down if you don't have it in your in your in your PowerPoint, but if you I did upload, you know, the PowerPoint is uploaded. So uh, the development, you're gonna take the same two point five acres. Okay. You're gonna change the land use. So 75% is going to be impacted, 25% stays wooded. So 25% will stay wooded, 75% will be developed. Of that 75%, 50% is lawn, of that 75%, 50% is lawn and 50% is impervious, which is all the buildings, all the roads, all the patio, sidewalk, whatever. So 50% is 50% of 75% is lawn and 50% of 75% is impervious. And you have to assume the lawn has 60% vegetation coverage. It wasn't a great seeding job. Really crappy seeding job. Anybody who's been a contractor knows that. So, so what is the percentage change in potential erosion for this location? So you have your original. Your original was 0 0.067 tons Oops, backspace. The original was here, 0 0.067 when it's completely wooded. So uh, the question is, what is it now as far as runoff? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to break you up into uh, two groups and have you work on it for the next 20 minutes. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to create a breakout room. Okay, two breakout rooms. Let's see. I'm going to shift people around. 
because Jack is only going to be there. Jack, you still there? I'm here. Okay. I'm going to put you with two people. Okay, and so Dave and Patrick are going to be together. Abby, Jack, and Will, you're going to be together. Okay, if for some reason not everyone shows up in your room, come back to the home room. I've, this, this has been, you know, didn't work last time completely, so I don't know what's up with it. I got hold of IT, but they haven't figured it out yet as far as Zoom. So um, I'm going to open the rooms. I'm going to give you 20 minutes. And then I'm going to bring you back, see if you can come up with uh, the answer to the problem. And maybe you want to show it, but you can just read it off too. If, if, you, ha you, know, if you want to show it, that's fine also. You might want to have an Excel spreadsheet open, do it real quick. Okay, so ready? Um, I'm going to open the rooms and I'll come visit. Need to accept. 